What I want to know now is why anybody thinks the ontological question is interesting and needs a solution. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, the epistemological question, I think, is very important. Yes. And, and well, what uh, do you mean by that? Because I keep saying ontology and epistemology. You're talking about can we predict? Can we actually do that? It? Is, yeah, yeah. Every, I mean, I mean, yeah. That is, we're all, we're all Dan is saying that the question of, of the nature of reality is less interesting than the, than the question <laughs> about the extent of our knowledge. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Because no. I would okay, amend that. that. You're, you're right. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that any, any uh, inquiry about the nature of reality, which isn't an epistemological inquiry, is already off into cloud cuckoo land. We don't, it's undecidable, we don't know what we're doing, we don't, it, it's something where you make up the rules as you go along. And I think the only thing that disciplines a consideration of ontology, the very, the very idea, you know, where, where do we do ontology? We do it in practical areas. To me, one of the really interesting things is that the term ontology, philosopher's term, where it's really playing an interesting role these days is in computer science. Mm -hmm. Because computer scientists, programmers, are having really interesting discussions, arguments, theories about what the right ontology is for doing certain sorts of tasks. Especially in medical and, and in yeah. health profession yeah. areas. But, but there, the term ontology has a real bite. And you can see how different ways of conceiving of the objects that your program has to be about makes a big difference. To take a trivial example, the elevator problem. You want to have a system that controls multiple elevators. Turns out to be a tricky problem. If you want to optimize, you don't want to have redundancy and so forth. And so people scratch their heads and they think about this in a very abstract way of what does, what's the umwelt of the elevator? What does, what's the manifest image of the elevator? What things does it have to keep track of to do the job we want it to do? And it turns out that the best ontologies for elevators, um, they have to have each other in the bank as sort of agents in, in the equation. They have to sort of keep track of each other as agents. They have to get sort of game theoretic in order to make sense of the problem. If you really want to write, and now look how, how fundamental and how sort of reductionistic this is. This is brute practicality. You're a programmer. You have been given the job of making and optimizing a control structure for a bank of elevators. And you come back at the end of a long and brilliant uh, analysis and you say, well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to endow the elevators with a sort of game theoretic sense of, them, of themselves as agents in a multi-agent world, and then it goes like a bandit. Now, that's a really interesting discovery about ontology in a very constrained space. And I think that if you don't have a, a task like that, and you want to talk about ontology, you want to talk about what's really real. You know, other elevators are real for the elevator. Good, interesting fact. There's the things that are real for us, the things that are real for uh, Stone Age people living in the Amazon. These are all, uh, back to Stephen's point at the beginning, there's all kinds of reality. But I think all of them are tied in a quite strong way to epistemology. And anybody who says, then there's the ontological as opposed to epistemological problem, I don't know what that's about. Epistemology was in the saddle in philosophy, for, at least from the time of, of Descartes. And what it brought us at the end was the positivism uh, with its proscription of a large number of the questions that we naturalists wish to answer. And, of course, there's a significant interaction between epistemology and ontology that they influence one another. But in particular, because those of us around the table, particularly you, um, have been in the forefront of advancing a causal theory of our epistemic states. You have a commitment at least to 
ontology being on a par with epistemology. And at least many other philosophers conclude that unless ontology is somehow prior to or more fundamental than epistemology, we are going to find ourselves back in the positivist cul-de-sac. And we're not going to even be able to treat the questions of naturalism as meaningful. Well, that, that's a diagnosis which I am not persuaded by at all. You might be right. I think the fact that, that uh, uh, sort of an overextension of epistemological concerns led to logical positivism, that's true. Uh, but I don't think that uh, the corrective to that uh, is to go back to medieval ontology. Right. <laughs> right. So, what that, so the question is, what's the middle ground? And, and, and I think that the middle ground there is that whenever you make an ontological claim or you reach an ontological conclusion, that thing better be significantly linked to your epistemology. Now, I think that's a very fair statement, mm -hmm. and I would be inclined to say, I um, regret that Weinberg isn't here, that Weinberg would insist, and Jerry has insisted all afternoon, and I would join them in insisting that the history of science constitutes excellent epistemological grounds for that ontological claim. Which particular ontological claim? Sorry. The reductionist, unificationist claim but that, I, that he right. has been defending, that I right. defend, that you, Jerry... You, you do. I just think that you're misreading the history of science. Yes. No, mm -hmm. I think that... But I, and I'm, I find myself to the right of all you guys, because I think that it's more than a history of science claim. I think that our evidence... You know, again, if the standard model of particle physics plus gravity is right, then it just says what happens within its domain of applicability and 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 the sort of all the other levels. Yes, yeah. but there the but there your Ooh, the, the epistemological <laughs> stand from which you make that claim well, has to do with the number of decimal places to which the predictions are accurate, which well, are, exceed that of any other theory. Yeah, well, but, 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 but let, me, let me just put it uh, in the, in this way. I think that my basis for making the for believing that the standard model plus gravity does. Uh, hold in the regime which I think it, it holds is as good as, for example, the uh, epistemological status of the claim that the sun gets its energy from nuclear fusion. I think that the logic that leads you to that conclusion and the evidence, therefore, is the just, same. Just, yeah. And that's not a history of science claim. No, that's no, just no. a way of doing science claim. By history of science, I simply mean the successive yeah. increases in the precision and range of our predictive confidence. Yes, but as we said earlier, there are different ways of looking at the history of science, like Anderson that was mentioned before a couple of times, including by Weinberg, who said actually the direction of the history of physics, fundamental physics, is that it's become increasingly relevant to the, last, the rest of science, precisely, one would argue, because of the failure of a reductionist program. So, you know, as you can see, there are at least two different reasonable ways of looking at the same situation and drawing very different conclusions there. I really I don't, don't think, think that either was, side has a knockdown argument. I don't think there ever was such a reduction, reductionist program, right? But and, if there and I think you're saying you don't, you, not only don't you, do you not need to invoke the history of science, but you really ought not invoke the history of science. It's simply a logical well, argument. That's what well, Sean said. It's a theoretical argument. It's well, a logical argument. What the it's theoretical not about the is. Well, what is the reductionist program? Is it the attempt to predict higher levels no from lower levels, or is it attempt to show consistency? No, no. Well, okay, that's a, that's an excellent question. So, so the reductionist program actually is a multi multitude of programs. Um, because there is an issue of reduction in the sense of, you know, can I predict higher level phenomena from lower levels? We all agree we right? can't, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and then there is an issue of theoretical reduction, right? That is, you know, can I actually come up with a principled way to show that chemistry in principle is just physics, or that biology in principle is just chemistry and therefore is just physics, okay? That one I think is more interesting as far as our, our discussion is concerned. And my reading of philosophical literature is that the majority of philosophers of physics, philosophers of chemistry, and philosophers of biology seems to be convinced that no, that program has not worked. There is no, there hasn't, nobody has actually articulated a reasonable way of doing that reduction other than saying, well, it's logically possible, therefore, well, therefore nothing. It doesn't follow that it's, there are, it's logically possible, sure, but it, you have to do it's the actual work. It's logically inevitable, I think, is what you're saying. If you buy, yeah, but how? It, based on what principle? Well, based on the laws, based on the principle that physics is. It's not enough. The the, the the standard model is incredibly good at, at the domain of application in which, to which it actually properly applies. It says precisely nothing about any other domain of application. Yeah. How about what it says about this thing? Yeah, what about? It? 
<coughs> the, all of solid state physics comes from quantum mechanics, right? And the technological reliability of what we can do with that knowledge is incomparably greater than it's ever been. And it suggests that higher level phenomena are fundamentally caused by lower level phenomena. First of all, some solid state phys physicists or philosophers of physics would actually disagree, not on this particular example, but on the generalization of, your, of that principle. Nobody here is denying that we can use, de deploy fundamental physics to do stuff even at higher level, including this stuff. The claim is not, no, nobody's claiming that, so let's not put up straw man here. The claim is that, yes, you can do certain things, and then there are other things for which you need new principles that you'd have no principled way to reduce to those fundamental f f things in where's physics. The burden, That's all the where's claim the, Where's the burden of proof? On those who've succeeded so far or on those who claim that you won't be Again, able to succeed in the future? depends on what you mean by success. If by success you mean the standard model works in the domain of application which it has applied, yes. But on the other hand, the, that program now. But every back. week we keep a, we keep increasing the range of application. Not Consider really. Consider decoherence and quantum uh, and uh, uh, quantum locality. Yes. Right and now it's a thousand uh, uh, molecules. Next year it'll be ten thousand molecules. Uh, why why are you so putting so far from anything on, that actually? Why are you putting a priori limits on the powers well, of microphysics? As I said, I'm not talking about a priori limits, but I think that it's too easy to say, well, the burden of proof is on your side, considering that there's been a lot of theoretical failed production. We don't even we haven't even reduced Mendelian genetics to, to molecular genetics. But you're, you're, you're hey, don't, get, you on, don't get on that subject with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're confusing the failure of reductions and the failure of us to be able to use lower levels to predict the behavior of others. But with nobody disagrees with that within certain limits. Pardon? I mean, nobody is, nobody's saying that using lower level principles we can make certain predictions. Yeah, we all agree we can't yeah, do right. that. Right. So, do you have a replacement? For the reduction of things for physics? Yeah, yeah. The, the, there is this, this this stuff that we talked about several times today about uh, you know using models in physics, for instance, in phase transitions that actually are use make use of things like singularities, mathematical singularities, not as a problem but as a feature of those models. Um, those those are very reasonable, viable ways of thinking about emergence. They are operational. They are mathematically sound. Uh, they give you the information that you want. Uh, they don't invoke any spookiness out there of any kind. But so you're saying it's conceivable that they're inconsistent with the reduction no, no, of no, 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 I don't know why anybody would yeah, think that yeah. anybody around the table thinks that inconsistency. Well, no. no, but I guess that I'm not understanding yeah. what they're They're consistent, is. but they're not sufficient. And they're, they're independent and autonomous. Right, they're new properties. They're, they're new properties that are.